Welcome to Rice University for the President's Lecture Series as part of Rice University's first virtual homecoming event, OWL Together. We're looking forward to this week's activities online and we welcome our alumni, but also parents, students, and others joining us for this week's event. Rice University's President's Lecture Series was created to enrich the intellectual life not only at Rice, but in the broader Houston community by bringing to campus, quote, celebrities of substance, speakers of both high intellectual distinction and broad public interest and appeal. Tonight's speakers certainly have that substance and broad appeal, particularly on an issue that this audience and the world are looking for more information on right now. They bring enormous knowledge on a subject every single one of us is not simply curious about, but in some ways desperate to learn more as COVID-19 affects our lives, every one of us in different ways. These two illustrious graduates are an illustration of where most of our impact as a university actually comes from and the contributions of our alumni, now almost 60,000 across the world. Their endeavors in many fields affect our lives every single day. I want to express a special thanks this evening to both Peter Fasolo, class of 1975 co-chair and roommate with doctors Gruber and Graham, shows you it's important to get along with your roommates, and Marty Soslin, class of 1975 co-chair, and also Charlie Landgraf, all of whom helped make this event possible. And of course, I want to extend a special thanks to Drs. Graham and Gruber for taking the time to share with us about their work. Now I'd like to welcome Yusuf Shamu, Rice's Vice President of Research, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the questions and answers. He's an outstanding leader at Rice, an extraordinary scientist, a specialist in bacterial infectious diseases, and also I should add, one of the key architects of our COVID response and reopening. Please welcome Yusuf Shamu. Thank you very much, David. It's a great honor to be here tonight in the company of such uh, esteemed fellow scientists. Uh, so it's a real great pleasure for me as well to hear uh, this story. I think it's gonna unfold. Uh, let me give some brief introduction to, the, to our two guests. Dr. Barney Graham is the deputy director and Chief of the Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Vaccine Research Center. He has, of course, a BA from Rice University, an MD from the University of Kansas School of Medicine, and a PhD in Microbiology and Immunology from Vanderbilt University. His primary interests are vaccine development for viral diseases, of course, viral pathogenesis, mechanisms of immunity, uh, and pandemic preparedness, something very uh, we've all become more aware of in the last year. His laboratory has developed novel vaccines for, uh, very, uh, for many important viruses, in, including Zika virus, influenza, and the first COVID-19 vaccine and monoclonal antibodies. Uh, they're also being in clinical trials at this point. Uh, so Dr. Graham and I both have the same boss at NIAID. Uh, I get my grants from Tony Fauci, and I suppose he has Tony Fauci is his boss as well. So we have that in common for sure. I'd also like to welcome uh, Dr. Bill Gruber. He is the Senior Vice President of Pfizer Vaccine Clinical Research and Development and responsible for the global clinical research and development of vaccines to meet licensure and pre-licensure uh, requirements. He received his undergraduate degree, of course, at Rice in mathematical sciences. He received his uh, medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine. So he had to travel all the way across the street. Um, he also, where he studied in pediatric and infectious diseases, and he was also the chief resident in pediatrics at Baylor. So he has over 35 years of experience in vaccine development, and I can't wait to hear how two roommates end up being in such strangely parallel career paths. I think there's a story to be told here, and I'm hoping that they're going to tell us uh, and also answer questions from the audience. So with that, I think I think that's sort of the first question. So what, what is the story of how you two met and how did you get into your respective fields of study? Was this all some sort of master plan hatched at, at you know, late at night and, and you know, somewhere on the quad somewhere? I mean, tell us a story. I'd love to hear it. 
So Barney, you want to start first? <laughs> okay, I can start. Um, I grew up in Kansas, and um, part of that time was on a farm, and so I learned how to solve a lot of problems on the farm, and we probably spent half of each day fixing things and solving problems before we could do any work. But when I got to Rice, I had my eyes opened to a whole new level of uh, problem solving and a whole new level of intensity. And, um, and Bill was, was my role model at that time because he had already taken calculus. I had not. I was a math major. He was a math major. And uh, Bill uh, helped lead me through that first year, I would say. And then, um, and then after uh, the junior year, I switched to biology. The topology class, we can talk about this a little later perhaps, but uh, topology at Rice during the junior year, fall semester, was so theoretical uh, that it, it, uh, I just couldn't uh, handle it and I had to do something more practical. And I went back to biology and, and then went to medical school. I started a research in medical school and at Vanderbilt University during my uh, residency and, and chief residency and ID fellowship, I pursued uh, research at different points along the way, but always headed toward infectious diseases, always headed toward viral diseases. And probably the defining event for me was uh, the beginning of the HIV epidemic. Uh, I saw the first case of AIDS in Tennessee in the fall of 1982 at Nashville General Hospital. And the, the development of AIDS and the way it really uh, took over our world, at least for those 10 or 15 years before we had antiretrovirals, uh, it, it drove a lot of people in my cohort into viral immunology, viral pathogenesis, vaccine development. So that's how I got started uh, in this direction, and we'll pick up more later. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Shamu. The, uh, the there was no hatching of our future, you know, in the in the quad. I, I, there's a fair amount of serendipity uh, involved, but uh, like Barney said, I came actually. I grew up in Houston, uh, in the Spring Branch Memorial area. And, you know, I was fortunate to have uh, someone like Barney as, as roommate, as well as Peter Fasulo. We owe him a great debt of gratitude for bringing us together in, in this forum. Uh, uh, we were actually in the uh, old, uh, or the newer part at that time of Will Rice College that sadly I see got torn down and was replaced with a newer building. But, but um, uh, yeah, I started off thinking I was going to be a physicist and uh, gravitated more to the math, but all along was very interested in biology uh, like Barney. And um, it's interesting that even though I was in, in at that time, I, mathematical science, uh, sciences, I think it's called something different now. Uh, my, I did a uh, sort of a senior thesis in a decision theory class that dealt with uh, the approach to diagnosis uh, using Bayesian theory. Um, and what's remarkable to me is, you know, the, the current COVID-19 trial uh, that we're conducting uh, depends very much on a Bayesian type of analysis. So it's sort of full circle. Uh, I, I went back and actually pulled up the paper that I, that I looked at and thank God I was young and, and, and smart then because I, I look at it now and it's pretty hard for me to understand anymore. <laughs> but in any case, the, um, so I, I, as you said, uh, I went across the street and um, uh, just really had to decide was I interested more in medicine or pediatrics pediatrics became a particular interest to me. And this is one of the first areas where we intersected without actually even knowing it. One of the key things that I became interested in is a condition called uh, respiratory syncytial virus, or that's the name of the virus that causes the disease. It's the single most important cause for uh, babies to be hospitalized. Uh, there are probably 40 to 120,000 children hospital every year. It causes a lower respiratory tract disease the children can't breathe. And it was during my pediatric experience that I decided I really had an interest in infectious disease and wanted to do something to either treat or prevent that. Um, and, uh, you know, I did my chief residency, did a, an infectious disease fellowship. 
And uh, this is where it becomes where our, our lives really did begin to intertwine once again. We uh, obviously uh, engaged in uh, the typical sort of holiday uh, uh, card exchange, and uh, each of us had been to the other's weddings uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. We exchanged in the usual pleasantries, but it was really at, at the point where I was, you know, kind of contemplating what I was going to do with my career. And uh, I went to a scientific meeting um, as a fellow, a, junior, a fellow junior faculty, it was sort of in a transition year um, at uh, Baylor. And uh, I was putting up a poster um, about respiratory syncytial virus. And I can't even remember the details. I could probably remember the details better at Barney's poster, but I, 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 putting up a poster um, uh, and who should be putting up a poster next to me but Barney Graham, right? And I looked over and I said, are you really interested in this too? I mean, we have no idea. Uh, and so uh, and Barney will share with you a fundamental part of his career has been involved with uh, RSV and he's made seminal discoveries that basically have really shaped uh, our approach to that particular uh, pathogen as well. It seems like um, like if you wrote this into a plot of a movie, nobody would believe it, right? Because it just it just seems like you're destined to be working together. And it's so funny you're both putting up posters at a scientific conference when you looked over and saw him. You know, yeah. it's just, it just, it's overwhelmingly straight and the same virus, right? I, mean, I, so, I, I, I can't speak for Barney, but I don't think either of us knew even what RSV was, you know, while we were undergraduates at Rice. No, and I, like, prob <laughs> I probably didn't even know in medical school, <laughs> but that was 1986. Uh, shortly okay. after that, um, you know, I was finishing uh, my fellowship and starting a PhD uh, and still working on RSV as a primary project and beginning HIV vaccine work as well. But um, so I stayed at Vanderbilt, but then Bill was recruited to Vanderbilt to be on the pediatric infectious disease faculty. So we were both at Vanderbilt during the 1990s and have uh, co-authored a few papers together on RSV and, and, and have been, had, had shared interests uh, in a number of different viral diseases uh, through that period of time. And then maybe Bill could uh, tell yeah. uh, what happened. Yeah, yeah. so we had, you know, we had good careers there. You know, we were tenured faculty and that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and an opportunity in, in my case came up where I was approached um, by the then head of vaccines at uh, Wyeth, which ultimately became part of Pfizer saying, had I ever considered, you know, going for a career in industry? And I thought, well, you know, why would I do that? I'm tenured, I've got an interesting research going on and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, it was a guy by the name of George Sieber. Um, and uh, he had me come take a look. And what I found extraordinary was the ability to really be engaged in clinical end-to-end -end development uh, on a global basis. Uh, I had some ability to do that, uh, certainly at Vanderbilt, but not to the scale, nor to have the, the number of projects. Now, it turns out, I mean, it was like walking into a candy store. <laughs> it turns out that probably what George Sieber had in mind of all the things we could do was overly ambitious. Uh, but, but it, you know, that was enough to attract me. And, uh, and I then uh, took a, a job in industry uh, so that I could be involved in global development. I've been fortunate to have an incredibly good team now for 20 years. That was in 1999. Um, that uh, has allowed us to have some success in the uh, development of uh, pneumococcal uh, conjugate vaccines and meningococcal vaccines that are in common use throughout the world, uh, 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 preventing you know, significant disease. Uh, I also had some experience with influenza vaccine uh, and uh, getting, the, if you've heard of the, the, the live uh, uh, nasal spray uh, uh, vaccine, that's a, a vaccine that we helped uh, develop with a, another company called Metamute. Uh, so it was a really great, you know, opportunity, but we still obviously kept in touch and, you know, we, we were actively engaged in, in those early years in terms of dealing with RSV and Barney certainly at the NIH was involved in that. I can remember making trips back and forth to the, you know, NIH and our, our you know, our lives continued to intersect, particularly in that space, but obviously also now in, in COVID-19. So it's interesting, you know, you went to industry and, and Barney went to government and you continued along these paths. And so 
it sounds like, and I have a lot of my students go on to work in the industry in the, in the pharmaceutical industry as well. And you both started from very quantitative backgrounds and sort of mathematically oriented fields. So, I mean, how, I'd be interested to know like, you know, how that experience has been. So we've heard it on, from the Pfizer side, you know, what it sounds like was a good experience. You know, the, the reasoning of getting into Pfizer makes a lot of sense in terms of the opportunities you have. Now, Barney, in the government, what, 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 what attracted you to the government mission? I was uh, was developing more of a classical academic career and was making decisions between being an infectious disease division chief. I was very much a clinician uh, versus uh, taking up this new opportunity uh, at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, where a new vaccine research center was going to be built. And it was going to be focused on developing an HIV vaccine, which I had devoted the last many years to. And so even though I was still doing uh, RSV work uh, for basic research, uh, most of my clinical research was on HIV vaccine development. So I went to this unique uh, facility in, uh, on the NIH campus to help develop the clinical trials program. But I wrote into my contract an invitation letter that I had to keep a lab that worked on RSV uh, and continue on with that. But this is a very unique place. Uh, it's now grown up to around 600 people. And it, it has not just a basic research building with about 200 and something people in it, but it has a number of engineers in our process development and in our pilot plant manufacturing. And then we have our own self-standing clinic. So we can do from concept to manufacturing to uh, a clinical evaluation and, and go through the whole uh, cycle, almost like a biotech. So it's sort of a biotech government hybrid type of a place. So again, there's sort of, there are some parallels there. Both of you chose you know, to go into a, a development of something that's sort of beginning to end, you know, you know, from the lab to the bedside basically, um, which is again, kind of an interesting thread that you have in common. Um, you know, I think having gone through HIV AIDS is also seems like it was an important experience, you know, the 1980s that sort of, I, I guess, you know, really drove a lot of uh, your thinking around vaccines and, and public health. Um, how do you reflect on, on, you know, those early experiences? Did they, did they just motivate you further into, into doing, you know, going down this path or did it solidify your interest in vaccine development? I mean, I don't think either one of you can answer that. I, I think it's interesting. You both really seem to you know, take the bid on this and run with it. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, it was that and, and the other pathogens we mentioned. We'll come back to the RSV because we actually intersected again in a, a, an unusual way that's led to some success. But, you know, uh, you know, vaccines are the single most important uh, medical intervention for public health. I mean, I think the only thing that exceeds the impact is, you know, clean water and sanitation. Uh, so the opportunity to actually prevent disease, uh, you know, ultimately on a global scale is a, you know, really great opportunity. I, obviously, HIV was an important experience. I mean, Barney mentioned, you know, his experience. When I came to Vanderbilt, um, the first uh, HIV uh, infected child um, that uh, was diagnosed as near as I can tell in the state that wasn't associated with hemophilia, which I think people, people are aware that with the uh, uh, blood product um, uh, use in that population, there were particular risks. This was an unfortunate individual that um, uh, received a transfusion as a premature infant. And, and then basically that's how they got uh, disease. So the mom was not infected. This was not uh, uh, transplacentally or, or acquired at the time of birth. And, you know, I, but I think all of that, I, you know, like Barney, I mean, Barney was much more directly involved in, in HIV vaccine development, um, but all of that served as a motivating factor. There were lots of opportunities to, you know, potentially uh, uh, develop uh, a vaccine. We actually had a very active uh, program with three different approaches uh, when I was uh, in, in the early 2000s at Pfizer. Uh, for an HIV vaccine. And that has remained a very difficult nut to crack. And I think Barney will agree with that. Yes, uh, Baylor, both Baylor and Vanderbilt are sort of famous for their vaccine research. And so we were both being trained in early faculty development in places that had uh, some uh, history and success with vaccine development. 
My uh, so I was I was just going to say that you know I went to NIH to start the clinic, but uh, as my career has progressed, I finally was uh, turned over the clinic to one of my uh, students who who now runs it better than I ever did, but. As my career has progressed, I've gotten more and more involved in basic research and, you know, more primary laboratory uh, work. And I think Bill has has taken it to a, a more of a clinical uh, trials, clinical evaluation, clinical development type of uh, a place. So the kind of work we do now is very complementary, I would say. Yeah, I think... I and, and again, one of the great synergies here, and, and uh, we've told this story uh, you know, for, a, a, I think, a, a magazine article that may be coming out uh, for, with the Rice Magazine, is that um, I like to say that in 2013, I know of at least one good thing that came out of the government shutdown. So remember that Barney was in the government at that time. You may remember the Republicans shut down the government. And uh, I had just come back from a scientific meeting on the, on the West Coast uh, that Barney couldn't attend because uh, you know they couldn't travel, they couldn't spend money on travel, they couldn't do anything, and and uh, he indicated that he and his uh, lovely wife Cynthia were you know up in the area. I live in uh, Upper uh, New York State. Actually, it's not people call it Upstate New York. I'm only about an, <laughs> about an hour from Manhattan, but um, the uh, and uh, and he called and said you know they were up enjoying the foliage. It was October. Uh, and wanted to come by. Uh, and I said, great, you know, I would love to get a chance to see you when you engage in the usual pleasantries, catching up on family. And I said to Barney, I said, by the way, I saw, you know, in the sci in science that you published, um, that you managed to crystallize the structure of what's called the fusion protein in its pre-fusion state. In other words, you know, before it's actually allowed the virus to attach to the cell, the, the important uh, structure and, and uh, this was a fundamental uh, uh, discovery uh, coming out of Barney's lab. But of course, the key is not only being able to crystallize it, but to stabilize it so you could, you know, put it into a vaccine. So I asked Barney, you know, I said, well, you know, what have you been able to do with this? And he said, well, here's what I would have presented if I had gotten a chance to go to the meeting, you know. And, and so he unfolded to us the... Um, the nature of this pre-fusion construct. And I said, Barney, you know, we really need to come down and pay a visit down at the NIH and see if we can uh, license this in because this is a fundamental discovery. And, I, and I'm pleased to report we're now in a phase three trial where this, uh, you know, the, the successor to this after we further stabilize the construct so that it could be a, a viable vaccine um, is now uh, being administered to pregnant women to protect their babies by passive transfer of antibody. Because as I said before, RSV is, is uh, most seriously affects uh, young babies, particularly those less than six months of age. So the idea is mother's gift of antibody has the potential to protect them. If we can induce more antibody in the mother, uh, you know, that child is likely to be protected. So there's another example of, of serendipity, but drawn out of this longstanding relationship that Barney and I have had you know, now you know, 50 years. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just remarkable. Um, so I guess, you know, I think the topic that I think all our listeners are probably very interested in is hearing your, your opinions or your thoughts around, you know, the, the vaccines that are in development for COVID-19. You brought up, uh, you know, a, a fusion protein, and we've heard a lot about, you know, the spike protein in COVID-19. Maybe for the folks that are not biologists out there, one of you could start with a a little bit of a brief summary of what you need to get a good vaccine. And, and you know, and then we can continue that discussion about where we are in this country and, you know, what you think about how we're doing and with regard to the vaccine development. I just happen to have a few things <laughs> sitting with me at my desk. And so <laughs> this, this is a 3D model or print of the fusion protein of RSV that sits on the membrane. And this protein uh, is what's responsible for getting the virus into the cell. And it completely unravels, this top part unravels, reforms, shoots into the cell, and, and then wraps back around it. It ends up looking like this. And so you can see that these are quite different uh, shapes. And for 40 years, people were using this uh, protein to immunize. And I don't know if you can see the red parts here, but the red parts and orange parts don't exist on that other, uh, other protein uh, uh, confirmation. So those are the 
most vulnerable places on the protein uh, for an antibody to attack and neutralize. And so being able to maintain it in that shape uh, created uh, antibodies that were much more potent than what anyone had seen before. So that concept, and it's ironic because I told you I went into biology because of topology, and now I spend almost all my time thinking about the surfaces of things and how proteins rearrange and fold. And so I want to, I just want to thank, I think sort of it's making up for dropping out of topology. I've always <laughs> been a little bit embarrassed about that. And so, um, so we applied a similar approach. The spike protein of coronavirus is like the RSVF protein. It's the thing that binds and rearranges. And so after the MERS outbreak, the MERS coronavirus happened uh, about the same time we were solving the RSVF structure. And so there wasn't a known structure of spike at the time. So we focused on making, uh, getting a structure of the spike protein of coronaviruses. And so this is the model, a 3D model of the MERS coronavirus spike protein. It's, it has a different shape, it looks different, but it has the same function the same principles apply. And so we spent seven years figuring out how to stabilize this into a position that would uh, make it more uh, immunogenic, meaning make it more able to induce an immune response. And so uh, that was where we were and knew that that vaccine, uh, that, that the antigen design would work for a MERS coronavirus. And we'd already been working with a company named Moderna because of our interest in pandemic preparedness with a rapid manufacturing platform. And so combining this, uh, what we call precision antigen design with the rapid manufacturing, uh, we, we were headed toward doing demonstration projects anyway for something that we call a prototype approach. And so when this uh, virus was announced in, uh, at the end of uh, December, we had our eye on it. And uh, when it, we heard the rumors on the 6th or 7th of January that it was a beta coronavirus, uh, we were even more interested. In, and on the night of the 10th of January, when they released the sequences, we uh, got up Saturday morning and started designing the proteins and things we needed to make to start the project. And, and then Moderna by the next Monday had uh, started uh, GMP manufacturing based on uh, the sequence and uh, construct that we recommended. So it wasn't really uh, uh, that we got into this so quickly. It's because we had all this information that had been built up around coronaviruses that that allowed us uh, to do this. So that's how we got started with the vaccine program. I, I think we got into phase one trials within 65 days after the sequence was released. And, that, and, and Bill should tell uh, the Pfizer story. Yeah, so the Pfizer story, you know, picks up obviously based on the seminal discovery from, from Barney's lab. Uh, there is a company called BioNTech, um, which is a German firm that we were already working with uh, to use this mRNA-based uh, technology for development of a better influenza vaccine. I think we all recognize that we have influenza vaccines that work okay when the, when the virus matches uh, the, the vaccine for the particular year, uh, but there clearly is need of improvement. And in, in particular, if you're ever going to have the potential to, uh, to uh, have a vaccine that can quickly uh, be developed and immunize a large population for a pandemic, which by the way, up to this point, well, you know, I thought the next pandemic was going to be flu. I mean, that's what we all talked about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, we hadn't really anticipated. I mean, MERS were sort of, you know, warning shots across the bow, uh, but, but uh, you know, we hadn't really anticipated, or at least I had, that, that you know, coronavirus was going to, you know, be what it, it, it emerged uh, to be today. So um, using this same type of sequence information, BioNTech was doing much the same thing, but we were behind. Uh, it was pretty clear that we were behind and it's really due to, uh, you know, obviously having quite a juggernaut of, of capability within Pfizer working with BioNTech uh, that we had done some unprecedented things in terms of mobilizing to get the vaccine into the clinic 
as well as to clinically develop. And of course, the question I always get in that circumstance, and I expect Barney gets the same thing. Well, you know, you know, are you cutting corners? Are you doing things that you otherwise wouldn't do that, you know, jeopardizes the safety of subjects in the trial or, you know, uh, violates the integrity of trials and that sort of thing? And the answer to that is a resounding no. What we're, what we're doing is eliminating a lot of the white space. When you've got a sort of a concerted effort where everybody, including regulators, are focused on this being the number one priority. You no longer have to go into queues with everything else in terms of review period. So for instance, if we you know, submitted something you know, typically after a phase two study, after we've got pretty good evidence that a vaccine's likely to work, there might be a 60 day clock before we would actually get an audience with the FDA to essentially be able to review the material. Well, now, and I, I'm sure this is true for Moderna and the work that Barney's doing with them, we're talking with them in real time on almost a daily basis, right? And it's a real credit. This is a place where government really, I think, doesn't get enough credit, particularly those folks at CBER, which is the Center for Biologics at the FDA, for working hand in hand with academics, with government, with industry, to move things forward. So as Barney will tell you, or I'll tell you, uh, July the 27th, we both had managed to progress. We managed to catch up, but Barney will point out that they actually started their phase three study in the morning and we started ours in the afternoon of that day. But, uh, and now we're both going like gangbusters, uh, you know, to try to get to a safe and effective vaccine. I mean, at this point, how many vaccines worldwide do you think are uh, under development, just as a, as a sort of a reminder that this is a worldwide effort. Every country, like you said, is everybody's focused on on this pandemic, and every country, to my knowledge, is is working hard to to solve this problem. And so, as you know, as scientists, I think you know we can take great measure of pride in the fact that we really dropped everything we were doing, and you know, and in in so many ways, and the FDA as well, to make progress on a vaccine. Because I don't, maybe uh, it might be helpful for you all to tell. What is the average time it takes to, to develop a vaccine when we're not under this kind of a crisis situation? Is there a kind of a rough estimate you, one of you would like to care to? It's, it's not months, yeah. let's put it that way. The, the typical answer is decades. Uh, it's measured in decades, not in years. And uh, I have a slide that shows when viruses were discovered and when vaccines were licensed. And uh, the shortest one actually is uh, influenza between 1933 and 1946 or seven, there was an influenza vaccine. It didn't work very well, but uh, it, usually it's in decades. And, and so I wanted to mention that in this case, a lot of what we can do with the structure, with a single cell analysis, with all the different antibody discovery things we can do, it's all been driven by the technologies that have uh, come from H attempting to make an HIV vaccine. So uh, we haven't made an HIV vaccine yet, but the work toward that has made all of these things possible. So right now, there's more than 45 uh, vaccines around the world in clinical trials, and there's another about 154 or five, uh, it, it's gonna change tomorrow, that are in preclinical development. And so this kind of technology, uh, over, especially over the last 12 years or so, has completely transformed the way we think about vaccines, about the way we think about development, and the way we think about design and concept of a vaccine. So it, it really has been driven largely by the work on HIV vaccines. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a plug for supporting basic research, because if you don't support basic research, you don't have the tools to, to make these kind of uh, conceptual changes. Yeah, and, and Barney and, and his colleagues are real champion of this, and obviously, you know, I support that as well. I will say that, you know, the, the notion of decades, we talked about RSV, right? We think we're on, on the cusp, you know, that, that pathogen was discovered in the late 19. 50s, right? And but we're finally at a point where we may have a vaccine. So from the identification of the pathogen to vaccine can take, uh, you know, many decades. I think for once you have something that you think, you know, has the potential to offer promise that's more than a gleam in your eye, it's probably about a seven to 10 to day course, seven to 10 year course is typical. If it's derivative from something else, like you're just expanding on coverage or, you know, you know, trying to improve, maybe it's shorter than that, five to seven uh, years, but no matter what, 
nothing has proceeded at the pace that I think Barney and I are experiencing in our lifetime, or frankly, in anybody's lifetime. I think uh, it was, you know, uh, months that probably had the sh shortest course, and that was several years, I think, in, in terms of, uh, of development, and that's back, you know, in the 50s and 60s. So um, uh, it, it is uh, a, a remarkable advance, and I think it bodes well about what can be done, uh, you know, Assuming, of course, that this vaccine is successful. I mean, we're all, you know, counting on the fact that it has the necessary properties that we've seen in the trials so far in terms of, you know, uh, the safety and the type of immune response that we think is going to provide protection. But the only way you can be absolutely confident is to do the, the clinical trials that are underway now. And, I, you know, I think Barney and I both agree that we're, you know, highly indebted to all the people that work with us, whether it's in government industry, in academia, uh, but if particularly the participants who, you know, choose to enroll in these trials, right? They, you know, th there's no way that we can promise ahead of time that the vaccine is likely to work. Um, so people are sort of, you know, taking a gamble with some inconvenience, right? Because it isn't just that they come in and get, you know, in our case with the, with the two vaccines we're working on, you know, two injections. Um, they have to have blood drawn, they have to be followed up, they have to manage electronic diaries or other mechanisms for capturing information in real time. So it is in some ways an infringement, not only on their time, but also on the fact that, you know, they, they are participating in an experiment to demonstrate that the vaccine can be both safe and effective. So I, my, you know, my gratitude, you know, goes out to folks that actually sign up to do these sorts of trials. It's, it's a really remarkable thing that so many do. And, you know, there are now over 30,000 folks that have chosen to do that for the Moderna trial. We're now over 42,000 for our trial. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's pretty remarkable. And that in a very confined period of time. Well, I think it's interesting that you both mentioned, you know, the important role that, you know, the, the foundation that all this was built on, the basic technologies, the basic science, and the basic work that had to go into, you know, other vaccine development historically, whether it was an RSV or HIV, sets the table for being able to do this rapid response now to COVID-19. Yes. And so it's interesting, this is something that, you know, I talk to congressmen a lot, and I, I tell them, you know, you have to make these investments in infrastructure and basic research to invent the technologies to solve the problems that you don't know you're going to have 10 years or from now or 20 years from now. It seems to me, you know, this is such a complex process. It's very hard to anticipate the future, right? He said, most of us were thinking flu, right? For the next pandemic, weren't really thinking, well, to my knowledge, again, I wasn't thinking it was gonna be a coronavirus. Uh, I was thinking flu like everybody else. And so it's interesting, you know, when I think about, I have undergraduates doing research in my laboratory, there are lots of our undergraduates work over at Baylor College of Medicine doing research. I think this is a nice opportunity for them to hear that what they're doing is really, you know, in the, in the anticipation of all the challenges we'll have in the future. So a lot of our students are doing research now in really profoundly uh, important ways now. So it's just nice to hear uh, that it's helped uh, in this case. Now, I want to highlight, if I can, one anecdote that, uh, that Barney's uh, uh, familiar with, because I think I shared this with him, um, uh, just along the lines of what you're saying. So we have a, 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 a good friend and, and colleague at Vanderbilt uh, by the name of Mark Dennison, who's devoted his career to looking at coronaviruses. And I remember being in a, a, in a meeting uh, where a distinguished uh, uh, professor from um, uh, Stanford was holding in court, and we carried on a, a lunchtime conversation with him. And as part of his spiel uh, for his lecture after after this, he you know turned to Mark Dennison, and he was talking about various people working on things that potentially were going to be important in terms of health of the world. And he turned to Mark Dennison, and he was, you know, he's kidding, but he, you know, he said, you know, Mark Dennison, of course, is working on coronavirus, and it doesn't really make anybody sick. Right. And so, you know, that's how far afield, of course, that was before MERS, um, you know, and before where we are today. But, you know, just to your point, uh, it, it really does show uh, the, 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 uh, the, the nature of you can't absolutely predict the future. So, you know, you know you, you've got to do your best to prepare for it by laying the appropriate groundwork. Yeah. We've got some so, questions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that your question about how many uh, vaccine efforts there are going on in the world right now, one of my um, hopes is that since we know now that there's over 200 groups in the world who can make a vaccine, that we all don't work on the same thing all the time. And having 200 groups work on one virus doesn't make a lot of sense to me, at least. And 
since there's 25 virus families that are known to infect humans and they all have a potential um, more or less to cause serious disease in large numbers of people. I'd rather see those 200 split into groups of eight to 10 and tackle all of those 25 virus families so that we can be better prepared for the future. And I, I hope those kind of arguments can be made. If you're going to see congressmen, uh, you, could, you could make some of those yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about after we've emerged from uh, COVID-19, I think you've raised a really interesting point that, you know, with all the expertise and, and knowledge now built in all these groups, whether we could sort of divvy up, you know, future anticipated threat agents right. Right. And then have individual groups work on them in anticipation that they could be problematic. I think that would be a fantastic, I guess if there's a silver lining to this pandemic, that might be one of them is we'd be so much better prepared if we if we make good use of those, you know, sort of newly evolved um, capabilities. I think that's a that's a fantastic idea. Um, I, I, I do want to I do want to get to a couple of questions coming in uh, from our audience. Uh, one person wants to know. Assuming that you know Operation Warp Speed yields multiple safe and effective vaccines, how does an individual decide which one to take, or, or maybe they won't have that decision to make? I don't know. Um, aside from costs and number of injections, you know, how would it, how would you, or as a as an expert, make that decision? You know, maybe I can start. I mean, part of it will be made for maybe not so much at the individual level, but uh, you may have heard, obviously. In in the press, sort of the progression from getting to something that could be used in, in this emergent situation, uh, as well as ultimately being, being licensed for more general use. So I think uh, what you're hearing, and, and part of this is driven by the, the time it takes to get all the science, as well as the time it takes to make you know, hundreds of millions, ultimately billions of doses to serve the world. So in that context, part of this will be driven by um, groups like the Centers for Disease Control and other advisory bodies saying, okay, here's where we think we can use the, the, the doses to greatest advantage to not only impact the spread, but also take care of those individuals that are most vulnerable. So I expect that over time, just in general, vaccine, once we have our first and second licensed vaccine, uh, or even for emergency use authorization, this earlier step, it won't be as everybody can run down to their CVS and get this, uh, you know, right away. Um, uh, it, you know, that, that will be. Otherwise, I think what people should be confident about is anything that's licensed is going to be licensed on being uh, shown to be safe and effective. And I think it's just important in that context to listen to the recommendations, to listen, you know, to what's described by advisory groups by both the FDA as well as the recommending body, which is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice of the CDC, and see what they have to say. They put out reports and, and you know, knowledgeable people like the folks that are, I presume, listening to, to, to us talk today uh, can access that public information and make their own judgment, make a reasoned judgment. But I think people should feel confident that anything that is licensed will have been proven to be safe and effective. Agree. There's many, many platforms. There's uh, more than a dozen different uh, conceptual approaches. There's three major approaches going forward into phase three right now in the US. The mRNA vaccines that Bill and I are working on. There's two adenovirus vectors that, where you let a viral uh, a replication defective virus carry the gene into the cell. And there's two protein-based approaches that should hopefully enter phase three trials by the end of the year. Some of this is gonna be a matter of supply. Uh, you know, I can't speak for Pfizer, but there's probably gonna be a few 10 millions of doses available uh, of the other mRNA by the end of the year, and a few hundred million maybe by the middle of next year. But, you know, there's 7 billion people on earth and we're going to need multiple platforms and multiple supply chains and multiple distributors to really get, get all of that done. So it can't, it probably cannot all be one uh, modality. So we're hoping that more than one thing works. We had, a, we had an interesting question come in um, and I'm going to sort of paraphrase the question because it's rather long, but uh, the question was, will the vaccines, as they, at once they are approved, will they have different levels of effectiveness? In other words, are they, is there a certain, you know, what, what they're, they're asking is, you know, would one vaccine be more effective than another vaccine? Uh, or are they, do they have to come out at a certain level 
of effective, they say safe and effective. And so how is, how is effective defined for a vaccine? Yeah, maybe I, I can start off with this. So this, uh, the FDA has really provided good guidance on this and, and their requirement is looking at uh, the nature of what you actually see in a, uh, the observed efficacy in the clinical trial, that the point estimate of efficacy, in other words, how the case is split between vaccine and placebo has to be at least 50% with the lower bound of the, con of the 95% confidence interval being above 30. And, and the reason for that is that, that it provides reassurance that you have more than trivial efficacy. Uh, it remains to be seen what one will see in terms of the level of efficacy that actually does, that does occur. There, are, there is the potential, for instance, of more vaccines coming out of, of head to head uh, comparisons in terms of immune response and potentially uh, efficacy. But uh, I'll give you a good example of where things are so dramatically different that, it, that uh, the nature of what's seen sort of takes care of itself in terms of the vaccine that gets used. And, you know, I, I'm old enough. Uh, obviously, as everybody knows, having graduated in 1975, uh, that I was a candidate for a vaccine called Shingrix, which is not made by Pfizer, it's made by GSK, and it's to prevent shingles, uh, or the varicella zoster virus reactivating. Um, and by the way, since I'm not from GSK, I can, with impunity, recommend that anybody that wants to prevent, them, uh, prevent shingles should seriously consider getting that vaccine. But it, it's a vaccine that did remarkably better than its predecessor, which was a vaccine called Zostavax that came from uh, Merck. So I think this will play, and, and, and in fact, it's taken over the entire market because it had, it had the, the Shingers vaccine has close to 90 something percent efficacy. The Merck vaccine had somewhere between 50 and 70%. And that became apparent without even having to do the comparative trials because the disparity was so great. So I think were we to see something like that, that would, um, you know, you know, guide, I think, decision-making and potentially what you know, vaccine that should be recommended versus another. Uh, but again, I think going into the pandemic, as I said before, people should be confident that anything that's licensed uh, at least has a level of efficacy and, and, and a safety profile such that, uh, you know, it would be, people should be confident about being able to use that vaccine. And I think and, and the type of vaccine we use over time might change. So it, it may be that five years from now, everyone will be using a protein approach. And, and 10 years from now, maybe there'll be live attenuated approaches available. But, uh, and before licensure of this vaccine, there may even be access to vaccine through emergency use authorization or what's called expanded access. And so those will not be licensed vaccines, but there will be uh, authority to use them for certain populations. And so uh, this is, it's gonna be probably very confusing uh, over the next six months to figure out what's really going on from uh, a lay perspective, because it is, it's confusing, I think, even to, to people in the field. I guess, you know, one person asked, um, whether, you know, as the virus mutates and changes, you know, through time, whether, you know, vaccines will need to be redesigned or remade uh, to a deal with, you know, a new emerging, say, variant of SARS-CoV-2. How often does that happen or what level of concern do you have for that scenario? I guess the first battle has to be won first, but I guess they're anticipating, you know, if we have to live with this virus for a long time, you know, will, will vaccines need to be redeveloped sort of like we do with flu each year? Right. I, we, I also direct our universal flu program, uh, universal flu vaccine program. And the difference between flu and this virus is uh, extreme in terms of genetic variability. Now, this is an RNA virus and it does mutate and it does change. And you'll hear about new mutations coming up. It can even have deletion mutations or duplications, it, it, it will change. But so far, especially with a vaccine that's making antibodies to multiple places on the proteins, uh, that, that's called a polyclonal antibody response. That kind of response is going to be fairly hard to escape for this virus in the near term. Now, there may be a point at which uh, two or three years from now, we may have to adjust things a bit. But I don't think during this next winter season, there's going to be enough change to, to affect the vaccine efficacy. 
Yeah, and, and, and we should say, and, and I know Barney and, and the folks at Moderna are doing this, we certainly are doing this, we'll be looking at obviously isolates that are obtained in association with the clinical trials as well as isolates from the world to look for escapes, right? And we have the advantage, obviously, when you've immunized a number of individuals in a clinical trial and obtained specimens from them, uh, you know, uh, blood specimens, you can look at uh, the ability of the serum from that individual to neutralize the virus. Why? Because of the presence of the specific antibody. And you can look for the potential for escapes. Much the same thing is actually done for flu. You know, to look and sort of see whether a novel virus, uh, you know, responds, uh, or, or rather an individual with a particular, uh, immunized with a particular virus responds well to drifted uh, uh, strains of influenza. So you can do much the same here, but I agree with Barney right now, I think we're fortunate that this does not appear to be as mutable in an area that would likely lend itself to frequent escape. We had a, another interesting question come in a little earlier, but I was sort of figuring out how to, how to ask this in a way that, you know, was polite. Uh, so, you know, one of our uh, listeners, you know, noted that the city of Houston and actually the Rice University uh, faculty participating in actually in some ways doing this project, looking at, you know, viral loads in, in sewage water and looking at, you know, wastewater and things like that. And I was, I was wondering, wondering, you know, thinking back to this idea of surveillance, anticipating the next pandemic, there's been some discussion that we need to have outposts all over the world looking for emerging uh, viruses like this and, you know, monitoring wastewater and things like that could be good listening posts for the, for the emerging pathogens. Um, do you think that's a credible idea? How do you feel about that? I couldn't agree more. Uh, the, the part of the pandemic preparedness is not just understanding the viruses and knowing how to respond. It's doing the surveillance and discovery. And I like to call it uh, filling in the, uh, the, uh, Anyway, the, the uh, surveillance and discovery and doing this sequencing all over the world is, is going to be really important to prepare, not, not just in human waste, but going out into animals. Most of the new emerging viruses that we're, we have trouble with have come from either zoonotic animal sources or are vector-borne. And so we need to go out into the wild and sequence what's in that uh, virion. Yeah, I think one of the great advances, and, and Barney, Barney's absolutely right, we've done this for flu, right? We've got a network throughout the world that does flu surveillance. It's why you, you, know, you find out that there's an outbreak in Hong Kong and we need to you know, do something to mobilize. Uh, uh, and one of the great things that's happened, and it's really because of the advent of, of, of sequencing technologies, that, and, and Barney, is closer to this on a daily basis than I am, you can go from this isolate to a sequence to a vaccine in a matter of days to a week or so. I mean, it's really kind of remarkable, at least something that you now have something you could begin to test. Um, and, and so, you know, but you're not going to do that if you're not out there, you know, surveilling for, you know, if that's a word, for the viruses or, or, or the other pathogens. So, yeah, it, it is something that, uh, you know, I think we could improve upon. Yeah, and and I, what I meant to say was filling in the periodic table of viruses. Uh, yeah. I, that's and, really funny. You know, going back to our old rice in organic chemistry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think that, that's a good way. That's a good way of. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. And I think as you know, as the, as you as you say, as humans expand in the world, to interact with the wild environment. You know, we get these opportunities for viruses to jump from animal reservoirs into humans, and then of course the world because we're all traveling all over the world all the time, you know, these, these pandemics can spread very rapidly. So I think it's just sort of a nature of how we've, we've grown, but I think that puts up the idea of having surveillance um, be a really important next step, as well as maybe developing our expertise, you know, in, in all the ways we're gonna need it in, in the future. And um, that, that question is actually being addressed already. Uh, this is one of the ways people do polio surveillance. So you go to raw sewage and it is basically uh, capturing all of the people within that catchment area. And so it is a, one of the ways it's being done for polio surveillance. And I should point out, give a shout out to Lauren Stadler's lab here at Rice. And uh, they're the ones working with the city of Houston, looking at the viral loads in, in the wastewater catchments here in the city of Texas, in the city of Houston. So I think, you know, it's great to actually have Rice faculty involved in this in this kind of surveillance effort. Um, 
one of the things that another question that came in is that there's been a lot of emphasis on you know the vaccines for prevention. Are the sorts of technologies that you're talking about and have been working on um, can they be developed in some way to help people who are already infected? So to sort of treat people, you know, we, we saw the president receive antibodies, for instance, early in his infection. Are, are some of the things that you're working on, do they apply across, not just for prevention, but for, for people who are already infected? Well, let me say a word about that, because one of the byproducts of all this technology and all that we're doing to prepare for making a vaccine uh, allows you to also discover monoclonal antibodies. So you can take cells from a survivor uh, who's had coronavirus infection. And uh, because we've been doing this already with a company called Abcellera, we uh, sent them cells from a survivor and we sent them the protein probes they would need to sort through it and find the right kind of antibody or right kind of B cell. And then we screened the sequences that they discovered. And that antibody 555 is the one Lily has taken into clinical trials for therapeutic purposes. And, and that antibody uh, looks like, and I think the Regeneron antibody cocktail is going to do the same thing, that if you treat early in disease, where there's only mild or moderate disease, uh, you can reduce the frequency of those people progressing to the hospital. So by taking a single antibody from a surviving patient that you've screened for high potency, I think some of these uh, types of products are going to help with that. Immunizing after infection uh, uh, may not uh, be very effective. It, it takes too long to generate a response, but I think the monoclonal antibody therapies will make a big difference here. Yeah, I, and this is one area where I may differ a little bit from what Barney says, I think the key to this is the, the notion of early, early uh, treatment, if it's going to be successful at all. I mean, there's a legacy of, uh, you know, use of monoclonals that, um, you know, haven't borne uh, fruit or haven't shown the promise that we hope for. And I think it's because, you know, what we're learning, you know, with, with you know, whether it's SARS coronavirus 2 or other infections, there's a cascade of events that gets set in motion fairly early on after an individual gets infected so that even after you eradicate the virus, that cascade of events continues. And, and the real question becomes, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to be somebody like the president who basically, as soon as you have the sniffles, okay, we're going to give you, you know, uh, desivere and we're going to give you, uh, you know, a monoclonal, and, you know, maybe in that sort of circumstance, but for most of the public, the idea of, of taking individuals in at the time of the sniffles and you know giving either an IM or IV injection of a monoclonal, I think it is going to be challenging. I think it does offer you know some potential for promise, but you know frankly, the, the real salvation here is going to be an effective vaccine that you can prevent the infection in the first place. Uh, we had another question. I think is a good one. Um, do you have any sense at this point whether how long the vaccine protection might last? That's a very contentious question, I know. So I thought I'd set it up for you guys. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean, this is all fair game. I, and I, I'll, I'll give the brief answer is no. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we know uh, yet. Uh, obviously, if you think about it, part of the reason we don't know isn't because it's unknowable. It's because we've had such a short period of time that we've been immunizing folks. So if we talk about the phase three trial, we just started that, you know, whether it's Moderna or us in July. So we don't even have six months out in those folks to know what actually is gonna happen. We're beginning to, you know, I think, gain some comfort that antibody levels are relatively sustained after you get a nice peak and maybe a little bit of a drop. Uh, but determining, first of all, how much antibody you need on board, whether you've established memory effectively that allows the individual after they re-experience that pathogen, even if the antibody is waning, um, you know, I'm hopeful that this is durable. It's not the end of the world, in my view, if it's something that has to be given annually. Um, you know, obviously, if it only lasts a couple months, that's problematic. Uh, but I, I would argue you know, part of that information will become available uh, in, from the clinical trials. For instance, in our own trial, we're going to be following people for two years. So we'll have an opportunity over that period of time uh, to get some sense of the durability that could help us then better determine, okay, how often would people need to be revaccinated? Now, we're just out to six months now from our phase one trial. Uh, yeah. Like Bill said, Pfizer has a juggernaut. I think we started phase one two months earlier than you, but you caught up with us to get to the phase three. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it, we just have to wait and see. But the, the antibody titers are, are hanging in there uh, better than maybe I would have expected. We'll, we'll see how the other modalities work. The, the adenovectors and the proteins and the other approaches may have different types of dur durability of immunity. I think, you know, I think something I think you've already touched on a bit already, but I think maybe we need to come back to uh, is the importance of people understanding and having confidence in the development of vaccines. You know, you've seen the same polls that I've seen where people have, you know, because of the contentious nature of this particular pandemic, there's there are people who are not confident, you know, or feeling nervous about the vaccine and its development. I've gone on, on Dan Crenshaw's show and it sort of reiterated that, you know, no, the FDA is not cutting any corners. These are, these are, you know, if you think about it, the scientists at these companies and the government are taking these vaccines and their families will be taking these vaccines. But I think it would be great to hear from you guys again, to reiterate the importance of the, the vaccine in resolving, getting us back to a kind of a normal world again, where we don't have to wear masks and be physically distance all the time. I just think that's such an important message to hear from people who are distinguished experts in the field and are a Rice alum. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. Bill, Bill said this earlier. I'm going to repeat what you said earlier, Bill, and then you can add to that. Uh, because Bill said earlier uh, uh, the truth. What's happened here is that we've compressed and done all the phase one and two and three studies and preclinical studies and all the process development for manufacturing and even invested in large scale manufacturing before we had an answer. So all these things that have to be done that are usually spread over seven to 10 years are all being done in about six months, but no step has been skipped. The only thing that's been put at risk here is a lot of money and a lot of time and effort. I don't think any of the major safety steps have been skipped and the FDA, uh, even just this uh, last week, has you know had another meeting with advisory boards that have emphasized the importance of maintaining the safety credentials of these vaccines. So, it it ha we have to reassure people that it has been done in a way, even even though it's it's not going to be an easy message, because if we have a vaccine, for instance, that's seventy or eighty percent effective then we would, to, to get up to a herd immunity or population of immunity of about 70% or so that we think would need it to drive it into a seasonal disease like our other coronaviruses, uh, we would have to immunize almost the entire population. So we're either gonna be immunized or infected until our population gets up to that 70% mark. And I think uh, Bill and I would both agree that the vaccine is going to be a lot safer uh, bet than the, than the infection. Right. I, you know, and I think what the public needs to understand, even for vaccines for which we have, a, you know, an established track record of the, the platform being used before, there's a huge amount of work. Uh, that goes on even after, in this case, either emergency use authorization or licensure. Uh, a whole, uh, and, and some of this was talked about, and, and you, you can actually access this with the uh, meeting that Bert, Barney was referring to as the, the BRPAC meeting, the Vaccines Related Biologic Products Advisory Committee uh, of the FDA, where ex external experts review, uh, this first meeting was really to set the ground rules. Here's what the FDA is thinking, you know, what do you think external advisors about assuring effectiveness and safety of the vaccine? But in, in the setting where a vaccine is developed, um, and after its license, we now go from studying tens of thousands of individuals to millions, both in terms of spontaneous reports that come in from the field, as well as active surveillance. I, you know, I, I can't even begin to count up the number of programs that we're already putting into place for active surveillance in anticipation of a vaccine that's going to go from tens of thousands to millions. I think one of the sad commentaries, and I try not to get too much into the politics, but I will just dip a toe in here, is this to some extent has gotten politicized, just like masks. And I think we have to do our very best to avoid that from happening so that it becomes, you know, a, you know, if you're, you know, a Republican, you either do or do not like a vaccine. If you're a Democrat, you either do or not you know, think a vaccine is a good, uh, is a good thing. And, and I think it's up to us 
to provide confidence to the public, uh, just as Marty said, that we're not cutting corners, that we're doing things to monitor the safety during the actual licensure path, as well as post licensure. So if we did identify that there was something you know, untoward, we would be able to make a decision quickly about that and, and act appropriately. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that helps provide reassurance. I will tell you, you know, just to give you an example, you know, uh, uh, we, we are, uh, made a, a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that's now used by, uh, routinely for all children in the United States or part of routine recommendation for, uh, against the most important bacterial cause of, of, of community acquired pneumonia and bacterial disease in children and as well as in adults. And, and um, even though we had gone from a vaccine that covered seven particular serotypes to one that covered 13. So it was just this successor. We still reduplicated basically all the safety work post licensure that we did with the first vaccine, even though arguably you'd say, you know, why bother? Because there's little reason to suddenly expect you're going to pick something up. So we take this incredibly seriously. Regulators take this incredibly seriously. The yeah, recommending bodies take it incredibly seriously. And I, I'm hopeful that that message comes through and helps the public gain confidence. Because as Barney says, you know, I certainly don't want to continue to live like this. I think most of us don't want to live like this. We're filling up graveyards and hospitals every day, um, you know, while this epidemic continues. And so we need to really focus on getting the right benefit risk assessment and, and providing confidence. I think that's really encouraging to hear. And I think, you know, it's a message that I think we just need to hear a lot and from people we trust. And I think in that sense, you two actually fill that bill very nicely for our audience because, you know, I think as, as Rice, as Rice alum, I think, you know, when we hear you, we know, we know a little bit about you. We, we heard about your distinguished careers. And I think it's really encouraging and just, we just need to keep that message going. And I think, I guess what Barney was saying is, it's either, it's either you can be immunized or you can be infected. And so I know which of those two I prefer to take my, my, you know, I would prefer not to have to wear masks anymore. And I prefer not to have to have our campus be at this sort of a lower density that we've had. Um, have you had a chance to sort of uh, keep up with Rice in, in terms of, uh, you know, how we're doing here? And, you know, do you have any maybe words of wisdom perhaps for, for students that are hearing your, your or words tonight? Yeah, actually, I, I'm glad you brought And I don't know how many students are listening. I mean, you know, you know, old guys like us, it's nice to hear kind of the stories and how we ended up. But, you know, the real value, hopefully, is, you know, sort of uh, identifying the possibilities that can exist. And I've actually it allowed me an opportunity to kind of go mem down memory lane. And I was sort of thinking, well, in preparation for this, you know, I would think about the professors that were meaningful to me, you know, particularly meaningful at Rice. And, and, and I think Barney would agree I mean, maybe we would have, you know, ended up on a similar course somewhere, but I'm not so sure. Um, you know, I think the experience that we had at Rice for critical thinking, uh, you know, uh, Barney, I think will agree, we tend to be pretty competitive, you know, and working really to strive to be the best. Um, and, and I think, you know, that was something that came out of Rice. It's nice that, you know, Barney earlier said that he kind of looked up to me while well, I looked up to Barney. We were kind of going head to head. We both did, you know, well at, at Rice. But I think, we learned to think critically. We learned how to write and speak. And hopefully we sound like we're reasonably able to speak in this forum. Um, and a lot of that really came from, from the Rice experience. And I, I can think of particular things, in, and I think we all can, in our Rice experience that were formative. One, one of which uh, you know, I, I shared with Barney the other day, and I, I don't know whether um, uh, Charles Stewart is still on faculty. I saw a picture of him. Maybe he is. He is. He's still here. All right. So, so you know, and he's still working with Bacillus Subtilis. So, I, I, the, 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 a poignant memory of mine is when he had us as undergraduates do a, a, a study in sort of transforming bacteria, and I remember seeing at the end of a glass rod DNA hanging down. There was so much there that you could visibly see it, and I, you know, talk. You seeing that is sort of the essence of life was an incredibly formative kind of uh, experience in my mind. And really, as I said, I was sort of thinking about physics and other things. It was one of the things that shifted me to biology. And so people should really take advantage of obviously the experiences, obviously the relationships that you forward. Uh, I heard uh, uh, President LeBron talk about, you know, get along as, you know, with your fellow roommates because you just never know where that path's gonna lead. <laughs> yeah, I, I also wanted to go back to say something about what Rice uh, meant for me and, and some of the experiences because um, I'm just going to talk about one of the professors, James Walker. 
So as I transitioned from mathematics back to bio biology and biochemistry, Dr. Walker uh, was one of the people who sorted out the synthetic, uh, you know, pathway for aminoglycosides. And uh, he would do things like walk into the classroom, start at one end of the chalkboard and spend the entire 45 minutes drawing out a set of chemical formulas. And at the end of that, he turned around and said, sometimes just uh, working out the purine biosynthetic pathway is good for the biochemist's soul. And that was the end of class. And we had no idea what he was doing until at the end, but he also sat in Fondren Library at the window reading papers every afternoon. And he once told us that um, if you enjoy learning, if you enjoy reading, then you're accumulating a debt. The only way you can repay that debt is by contributing back to the knowledge and things to read and uh, things to learn that, that um, for the next generation. That, that comment, I think, has uh, lingered with me all the way through uh, this, my whole career. And so I want to thank him uh, and his family for that. Well, that, that is a, that I think that is a fantastic place for us to sort of end up. And I think, gentlemen, you have paid your debt. Uh, you have done more than I mean, you're. I know uh, Dr. Walker when he, I first got to Rice, and I know Dr. Stewart well. He's still here at Rice, and um, I, I think they'll be delighted to. You know, I mean, Dr. Stewart will be delighted to hear that, and you know, I think it's a good lesson. I think it's a great, great words to live by. Uh, that we all owe a debt to the next generation to train and to pass on our wisdom. Uh, I think that's something at Rice we take a great deal of pride in, and I'm just, I'm just so pleased to have met you at least by Zoom, and I look forward to a time when I can meet you in person, uh, vaccine already in me, hopefully, at that time. <laughs> hopefully. I see David has joined us again. David, did you want to make any comments at the end here? Well, I've actually been here the whole time, but I, I, I thought people would want to focus on the uh, Dr. Graham and, and Gruber and, and the esteemed moderator. Just thank you both so much. What a great session and, and combination of reminiscences and learning about the virus and what's going on. And then I think, especially to the end, maybe drawing some connections between those two things. You know, uh, sometimes folks are pretty critical of higher education these days and whether we're really achieving the kinds of things that, that we hope to achieve. And, you know, folks like Yusuf are producing amazing research at the university. Uh, it's really extraordinary uh, what's going on uh, but as I said at the beginning, the, the, the monumental impact of our relatively small university is really in folks like you who have taken that education, gone on to more education, and then, uh, as you so well expressed, giving back to the world. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, we're doing our best here at, at Rice, and uh, we're pretty well um, you know, opened up with caution, with a, a low uh, positivity test rate, and we're going to continue to do the best we can and uh, have a combination of things on our campus and, and virtual things. And the, the good news is, I assume nobody on this call has a very long commute home. It's usually down the, down, up the stairs or down the hallway. So thank you all again for being a part of the President's Lecture uh, Series and this very unusual and special um, a weekend that we've uh, organized for all of our alumni and parents. Well, thank you for having us. It's been a yeah, privilege. Thank you for letting us reconnect. And to Peter Fasulo and Mike Nicole, our other roommates, uh, <laughs> you know, look forward to seeing you too. <laughs>